to receive from God and not miss out. Now let's go to the very important scriptures, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7 to 9. Now the reason why we're listening to the sermon, we're listening to the word of God, you know, every Sunday, and also the kingdom warriors every Thursday, this is the reason. This is the reason, you know. How come God didn't just get us saved and then take us to heaven right away, you know? No, there's a reason. There are things that you can learn in heaven. There are things that you have to learn on earth. Amen. Amen. So even Jesus had to do that. Okay? So look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7 to 9. How many of us want to be wise? How many of us want to be wise? How many of us want to be wiser? Yes. Wisdom is the principal thing. Go to the principal's office. <laughs> Wisdom is a principal thing, therefore get wisdom. Who is the one to get wisdom? Me. Me. So don't blame God for not giving you wisdom. Therefore get wisdom. And with all your getting, get understanding. You know, Christians should be the most active people on the earth. The Bible is full of being active. <laughs> So, get wisdom in all you're getting. Get understanding. Exalt her. Exalt understanding. Exalt wisdom. What will happen? She shall promote you. Where's my promotion? Comes from wisdom. Comes from understanding. She shall promote you. She shall bring you to honor. I want everybody to honor me. I want others to honor me. I want my colleagues to honor me. Who shall honor you? When you exalt wisdom. When you exalt understanding. She shall promote you. She shall bring you to honor. She will actually bring you and sit you in the seat of honor. She will bring you to honor. What happened? When you do embrace her. Not just a casual hug, not just a casual hello, but you do embrace her to your heart, that she's dear to you and precious to you. That's why we listen to preaching. That's why we listen to the Word of God. Preaching and the Word of God is what your pastor or what the evangelists or the prophets, or apostles, what they have studied the Word of God and what they have juiced for you what they have cooked up for you and it's a good meal and it's a good drink amen hallelujah amen so how to receive from god and not miss out now we we're looking at prayer this morning now we want to ask questions that you know people will ask or questions that have come to me when i'm you know preparing for the word so how come some people don't pray? How come we don't pray? Some don't or seldom pray because they don't believe in prayers. Not the kind of belief that takes you to action. For example, if I believe I'm hungry, you know, I can hear my belly. What will happen? I'll go either buy some food or I'll cook some food. Belief brings action. That's true belief. Otherwise, it's just contemplation. Some don't or seldom pray because they don't believe in prayers. They think that prayer is just a religious activity. Some don't pray because they don't know how. Don't have the habit of praying. We have to understand that spiritual activities are foreign to the flesh. Sometimes the flesh or the soul is not comfortable with spiritual activities. Sometimes the soul or the flesh even finds spiritual activities offensive. So it does take a bit of warming up to get into the spirit. It does take a little bit of warming up to get into the spirit of prayer. And that's why you notice that in prayer meetings, I will always be, always be like, come on, let's build the, the atmosphere. Let's build the, the prayer atmosphere. Let's build the prayer atmosphere. And then others will just slide. You know, others will start to flow and catch the spirit. Okay, that, that's why. 
And、uh, some don't pray because they think that their prayers are too short or not good enough. We need to understand that prayers don't have to be long to be powerful. Short prayers can be powerful and heartfelt. Spirit-led prayers can be short and to the point. And we talk about the sword of the spirit. When you're praying, you're using the sword. You're stabbing the enemy. And that's why, when you know the word, your sword is sharp and to the point. But if you don't know the word, or if you don't understand the word, or if you seldom hear the word, then your prayers are always repetitive. Just religious, because your sword is blunt, and when you wield a sword, you have to apply the force. The force is the faith. The force is your heart. And when you have a lot of guilt, condemnation, or distractions, then you can't really exercise your sword with the force, or the power, or the accuracy. Understand what I'm saying? And some pray only when they are desperate, in times of death, accidents, like it's a last resort. Let's just throw some darts and hope that some will get it, right? Some pray as a religious duty to God. You know, oh, I better pray, or else, you know, I'm not carrying out my duty, and God may get upset. You know, I don't want to offend God. I need to please God dutifully. So some pray as a religious duty, and some pray out of guilt and fear. Guilt. Be careful with guilt; it will mislead you. Some pray out of guilt and out of fear, scared of offending God or missing out on His blessings. If your heart is not in your prayers, you are not praying. If you notice that you're praying out of fear, then you are not being led by the Spirit. If you're praying because you are guilty or condemned, or you feel guilty, you feel condemned. That's not the Holy Ghost leading you. Prayer is a weapon. Prayer is a weapon that God has placed in our hands against the enemy, not only for ourselves, also for the church. And like any language, because prayer is a language, just like a solicitor, just like a prosecutor, all right, just like a barrister. We're talking about the courts of heaven. So, like any language, if you don't learn it, you won't get it. Chinese is my native language. I have to learn English in order that I can speak English, and I need to practice speaking English in order that I can improve in the fluency and the accuracy and the expression of my language, English. And just like any language, you don't speak it, you will lose it. If you doubt that God had given you. Your prayer language, the tongues, and then you doubt it, and then you belittle it, and you don't use it. You will lose it. If you don't use it, you will lose it. Just like a natural language, I can speak Thai. When I was living in Thailand, I lived there for seven years. I could fluently converse. I could go to the market. I could do things, but because I haven't been using it for a while, I've lost a lot of it. And if we don't use the language of God, then we will feel like a stranger. We don't know how to express ourselves. We miss the promptings or the spontaneity. When it comes to spiritual things, spontaneity is very, very important. Spontaneity. You know, somebody said, "What's in you is like in a a toothpaste. What's in the tube is a toothpaste, right? You squeeze the tube, you get the toothpaste." So the devil will squeeze you to get what's on the inside of you, and situations come when the inside of you is faith. The devil tries to squeeze you, but faith will come out. So spontaneity is very, very important. 
if you don't practice it, you will lose the spontaneity, you'll lose the revelations, scriptures don't come to you anymore, images don't come to you. Every child has the innate ability to speak. Every child has the innate ability to make a sound. Every child. But he still has to learn the language. So we have to learn the language of heaven. We have to learn the words of heaven. The Word of God says, open your mouth and God will fill it. There's a God word part, there is a man word part. Our part is to open our mouth and God's part is to fill it. If you don't open your mouth, you will never be filled. So don't blame God. We have to be in the flow in order to be in the glow. How, how many of you want your face to glow? How many of you want the glory of God? You have to be in the flow of the Holy Ghost to be in the glow. The glow is in the atmosphere. Have you ever seen paintings of a saint with a halo on his head? How many of you have seen paintings like that, pictures like that? It's more than just an arc. Your whole person, your whole being is enveloped in the glory of God. It is written, those, who just, those whom he justify, he will also glorify. Amen? So it is a promise. When the light comes, when the rapture comes, when the light comes, we're all lit up on the inside because Jesus comes in his glory. Then you'll be lit up on the inside. Why? Because your wick has been trimmed and your oil is fresh. Can we say amen? And you're used to hearing the voice of God. And so when God comes, the trumpet calls, you will hear the voice and shoop, you go up. So we need to get into the practice of praying spirit-led prayers. It is a practice. You need to practice. And the more you practice it, the better you become. And your whole being becomes so in tune with God, like Enoch, you'll be caught up into heaven. Make sure that you listen to the kingdom warriors last Thursday. Another question. Can we pray with the best of the heart, with earnestness, tears, and strong cries, and still miss God? What's the answer? Yes. There are many Christians that have been hurt, upset, offended, because according to them, God did not answer their prayers. It's very important that we get into understanding. We don't just tell people, go away. Of course, God answers your prayers. When you know, and you know, and you know that you have prayers that haven't been answered. So we need to get understanding. Say to the person next to you, I'm getting understanding. Let's look at the answers to prayers. Why are there unanswered prayers? Why? Is it due to God's sovereignty? How many times we have heard God is sovereign? He will heal you if he wants to. If he doesn't want to heal you, you won't be healed. God is sovereign, so just stay poor. The poorer you are, the more spiritual you are. So if our prayers don't get answered, is it due to God's sovereignty? Is it because God has had a bad day and he doesn't like you? <laughs> or you're not good enough or you're unworthy? Is it that? Come on, answer me, church. No, no. Go with me to Matthew chapter 6 verse 10. Matthew chapter 6 verse 10. Who is the one praying this? Matthew chapter 6 verse 10. Who is the one praying Matthew 6 10? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Who is the one praying that? Matthew 6 10. Come on, tell me. Who prayed that? Come on, louder. Who prayed that? Jesus. Jesus. 
So wouldn't God answer his prayer? Yes or no? Wouldn't God answer his prayer? Absolutely yes. But how many of you have watched the news? How many of you is aware of what's going on around us now? It doesn't like, it doesn't look like that the prayer had been answered. We can't see his will happening on the earth. His prayers, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We haven't seen it yet. We haven't seen it yet. We haven't seen the will of God taking place on earth as it is in heaven. If you look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, Matthew 11, verse 12, I'm going to rock your boat, okay? <laughs> but then I'll stabilize it. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. Now, the King James translation doesn't give you a very, very good um, understanding. In fact, the Chinese translation is a lot better. Um, and also, there's another translation called God's Word translation. Okay, God's Word translation, which is the same as the Chinese Standard Version, and it goes. Uh, forget about the King James, all right? We don't need that PowerPoint. From the time of John the Baptizer until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful people have been seizing it. Now, we need to understand that when the scriptures were translated from Greek to uh, English, okay, they translate out of what their hearts were thinking. And to a lot of the very, very good religious Christians, you have to suffer on earth until you go to heaven. Because, of course, you know, they've seen the crucifixion, they've seen the persecution, they've seen the martyrs. But that's not the whole full gospel. Yes, there will be light afflictions. There will be persecutions in order that the victory will manifest. Jesus died on the cross in order that his victory will manifest in our lives. So if you look at this description here, amen, well, if you look at the King James, it says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. Now, I don't know, God had given me the grace because when I first read it, I got it. The kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force. I got it right away. The God is saying to me that the kingdom of heaven had to, had to make its way very powerfully and forcefully because the earth is so full of sinfulness, so full of demonic activities. That's why the kingdom of heaven had to go, had to advance forcefully, stronger than what's around the kingdom. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Because of the opposition, because of the adversary, so you have to advance forcefully. And that's why the second one, the second part of that verse is correct. And the violin, referring to the church. And that's why this translation says that the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and the forceful people. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember in Hong Kong, I remember those days when I was still working in Hong Kong, you know, taking the, um, the MTR, the Mass Transit Railway, and it was jam-packed with people. And how did you get in? How did I get in? I got in forcefully. <laughs> I took it by force. <laughs> Otherwise, you just stand there for the whole morning and you wouldn't be able to go. You know what I'm talking about, okay? And the same way in China. How did I get in when I was in Wuhan? You had to get in forcefully. You know, when we were crossing the roads in Wuhan, China, you know, you can't be polite because the cars won't stop for you. So what happened was that a few of us, we would just hold hands, you know. We hold hands. And then we say to each other, okay, ready? One, two, three. Boom! <laughs> we forced the cars to stop for us. <laughs> Understand what I'm saying, okay? The devil won't stop for you. Demons won't stop just because you look so cute. 
Demons won't stop just because you're polite. <laughs> you have to force your way. Can we say amen? Hallelujah. Amen. So, we need to understand the workings of God in order to see, you know, why sometimes prayers are not answered or it looks like your prayer is not being answered. Number one, we need to understand that God works dispensationally and God works also personally. When we talk about dispensations, we're talking about the global workings of God, as we can see now on the news. So there is a dispensation that happens globally, okay? And that's how you pray for your nation, for your country, for Israel, for what's happening worldwide. Okay, number two, God works by personal attainments. Personal attainments. That means what you have learned, what you have done, the treasures that you have accumulated, the anointing that you have built up for yourself, all those things matter. In the kingdom of heaven, for you personally, there are levels. There is the level of the ankle, the level of the knee, the level of the waist, the level that goes all over you. Your personal walking with God, your personal living with God comes by measures. Jesus said, according to the measure that you use, it shall be measured unto you. So there are measures, there are degrees, there are levels, there are positions. When we talk about personal prayers, people prayers are personal, relational, your own relationship with God. Do you know him relationally? Do you talk to him? Do you ask him questions? Do you sing to him? Are you being moved by him? So relational, okay? And your relationship with the members of the body of Christ. Intercessory. Your prayers can change your world. Even though the rest of the world are suffering from COVID, even though the rest of the world is suffering from pestilences, epidemics, even when everyone around you is going, achoo! You know, my daughter is a, a doctor, and she said to me specifically, Mom, make sure that you cover your nose and your mouth when you sneeze. I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and she showed me a video. Look at all the germs that would come out of a sneeze. But the good news is that the supernatural laws, the supernatural laws are over and above the natural laws. So even when the world around you is falling apart, you can stand strong and powerful. There is a calling and there is a separation. Once you're called and you answer to the calling of God and you say, yes, sir, I obey you, I trust you, then God separates you and you have a world of your own with God. Can we say amen? Hallelujah. There is a calling and there is a separation. Your world then is different because of your attainments. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. Hebrews 11 verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible. Now, if God says impossible, forget it is impossible. Okay. If somebody says to you, impossible, do it, it's possible. But if God says impossible, it's impossible. Without faith, it's impossible to negative. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. You can't please him by good works. 
You can't please him just serving him all the time. You can't please, you can't please him by just being a, you know, a, a church guitarist for 20 years. He could only be pleased by, by, he can only be pleased by, one more time, God could only be pleased by faith. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God, what is faith? Must believe that he is. Number two, that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You ask this question, isn't God here already? Why do I have to seek him? You have to seek him. Because there's a lot about him that you don't know. There's a lot about him that you don't understand. His ways of operation. How does he work? How does he move? What does he want? How does he send the angels? How do the angels work for God? Number one, believe. Number two, believe that he rewards you as you study to know him. Can we say amen? Amen. God rewards us for our diligence, for our faith walk, for our love obedience. What is his reward? Answering your prayers. Giving you the desires of your heart. Go with me to Psalm 46 verse 2. Psalm 46 verse 2. Psalm 46 verse 2. Therefore, this is David speaking, Therefore will we not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Now this is a very bold statement. He's telling me that even in the times of earthquake, I will not fear. He's telling me that even in the times of a tsunami, he would not fear. Is that possible? How is it possible? Because he knows in whom he believes. He knows that his God is the God of his word. As long as he has the word, he knows that he is safe. He can trust God. David knew his calling. He knew that his calling did not come from himself. He knew his victories did not come from himself. He knew in whom he believed. And he had seen what his faith had given him. He had seen what his faith had done for him. He knew that God honored his word. Amen. And that's why he made room for God. He made room for God. Amen. His world, even in the midst of an earthquake, even in the midst of a tsunami, his house is lit up. His life is lit up. His world is lit up. And is separated from the darkness and all the sinful, demonic activities around him. In God, we trust not when everything is doing well and fine. I remember I said to God one time, I said, I don't want my faith to be comfortable faith. I want my faith to be able to stand and carry me in tough times. Very important. Very important. We understand that. How many of you have read the book of Exodus? How many of you have heard about the ten plagues? The ten plagues. What did God do? He said, I will separate my people from your people, he said to Pharaoh. And even in times of all the cosmic disasters, the people of God, the Jews, the Israelites, they stood protected, unharmed. Even when there's darkness all around them, they had light in Goshen. This is what Christianity is about. This is what Christianity is. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That we are separated. We are separated. 
We are a different group. Come say with me, my case is different. My world is different. There is a separation. There is a calling. There is a separation. As soon as you answer the call, there is a separation. He delivers you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. But if you go back to the kingdom of darkness, don't blame God. God does not work by emotions, feelings. He works by spiritual principles. There are songs, portals, levels, degrees, laws, and orders in the realm of God. There are spiritual logistics, protocol that heaven follows. There is the throne room, there's the judgment card of God for the execution of orders. Angels take orders, assignments. They don't do whatever they want. There is a heaven for the saints and there is a hell for the sinners. God is not random. We can be, but not God. God is not random. There is a timeline. Let me give you the timeline from where we are now. We're heading for the rapture of the church. After the rapture of the church, the tribulation will start, and the tribulation will continue with the great tribulation, and then follow by the battle of Amagadon. Even after we've been raptured, there will be another rapture that will come. The Holy Ghost is still on the earth, and there would still be people that would be raptured after the rapture of the church. And then after the battle of Armageddon, the beast, or you call him the Antichrist, and the false prophet will be cast into the lake of fire. And then Satan will be locked up for a thousand years. We call that the millennium. And then Satan would be let loose again to deceive the whole world. And after that, God will judge those who had rebelled by the devil's deception and provocation. And Satan will be cast into the lake of fire together. That's where the, the beast and the prophet were. And then after that, after that is the white throne judgment. The white throne judgment is when the dead from both death and hell would be summoned and judged based on the books, based on what they had done on the earth. And they would be cast all together into the lake of fire, where Satan, the false prophet, the Antichrist, where they are. And then as far as the things are concerned, there will be a new heaven and a new earth with the descent of the new Jerusalem from heaven. And then we'll have eternal pleasures and joy forevermore. So God has a timeline. He is not random. If you observe the universe, observe all of his creation, everything has an order. If you look at our body, our bodies follow an order. Okay, so God is not random. We need to change our thinking. Also, we need to understand that heaven is the governance of God. When we talk about heaven, there is a government, there is a governance. It's the governance of God with a system and with an order in place which is more powerful than the laws of physics. How many of you studied physics when you were in high school and in university? The laws of physics are very complicated, intricate. It takes clever people, smart people to understand. And if it's in the natural, how much more in the spirit? Okay? So there's still a lot about God that he wants us to know. Now, don't be so simplistic. Christianity, Christianity is simple but not simplistic. How many of you understand the difference? You can be simple, but not simplistic. So don't get to know God in a simplified version. You need to mature. And that's what we read in the beginning. In all you're getting, get understanding. Wisdom and understanding. And that's why in the fivefold ministry, you have the teacher. Okay? It's very, very important. 
Okay. We need to understand that heaven is the governance of God with a system and with an order in place. Let's look at James chapter 4 verse 3. James chapter 4 verse 3. We're looking at how come some prayers are not answered. James chapter 4 verse 3. You ask. Now this is referring to the church, not referring to the world. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. Now this is what we want to focus on. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. Amiss means you've missed it. Amiss means your prayer ends up at the wrong place. You're missing out. You've missed the point. You've missed the target. Of course, the, the context of this scripture is dealing with the intention and the motive and the purity of the heart. Okay, let's grant that all of our hearts are right, our hearts are pure, our intention is good. How come we still see prayers that have not been answered or prayers that we think have not been answered? Go with me to James chapter 4, verse 2. Now remember, the book of James was written to Christians. In fact, the Bible, the majority of the Bible, is written for Christians. Okay, please understand that. That's why you can't go to the Gentiles and go to the unsaved and talk to them as if they were Christians. They know. They don't have that understanding. Okay? So go with me to James chapter 4, verse 2. This gives us a clue. The last part of that scripture. You have not because you ask not. So isn't this implying that if we ask, we shall have? Isn't that, isn't that the implication? You have not because you ask not? Now go with me to Matthew 7.7. 7, and it's repeated in Luke 11.9. Matthew 7.7. 7. This is our Lord and our Savior, Jesus, talking. He said, ask and it shall be given you. It's like... Unconditional. And then go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. 2 Corinthians 1, 20. 2 Corinthians 1, 20. For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen. To the glory of God by us. So God answers our prayers because he wants the glory. He wants the light to build up, to save the world. And we give him the glory. So the more prayer answer, the more prayers are answered, the stronger the church will be. The stronger the spiritual power you will have. And then God does not make empty promises. Jesus is the one who said, let your yes be a yes, no be a no, anything other than that is of the evil one. Didn't he say that? Yes. So God does not communicate uncertainly. He said, yes be a yes, no be a no. So he is committed to his word. So whenever the word is not happening, it's not his fault. Whenever the word is not happening, whenever we don't see our prayers answered, it's not God's fault. It is not God. It's not that God is changing his mind. It's not God is withholding good things from you. It's not that God is angry with you, upset with you, not blessing you. Go with me to Psalm 84, verse 11. Psalm 84, verse 11. Now, this is a very important sermon, so please get it. Psalm 84, verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly, from every good man. No good thing will he withhold. Air is good, water is good, sunshine is good. And this is not talking about intricate details. This is talking about the sun. This is talking about the clouds, the sun and the shield. The sun for us and the clouds to cover us. Okay? So it's very important that we, we understand that God is true to his word. He keeps his promises. He's not yes and no, but he's yes and amen. And he does not withhold good things from us. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27. Proverbs 3, 27. All these scriptures are very, very important. We need to know. Proverbs 3.27, 
Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the power of your hand to do it. So God is telling us, if you want to be wise, don't stop blessing people. It doesn't matter whether they deserve it or not. When it's in your power to give it, give it. This is the book of wisdom, Proverbs. That's why forgive, do good, bless, for no reason but the, the word of God. Amen. So, okay, so since God tells us to do that, don't you think that he would do it himself? Yes or no? If he tells us not to withhold good, do you think, don't you think that he also would not withhold good? Of course. So we clear all the doubts. So we've killed all the sacred cows now. <laughs> so how did we pray amiss? How did we pray amiss? How did we miss it? You want to know? Are you ready to know? Number one, number one, we don't take God's word seriously enough. I make the same mistake. We don't take God's word seriously enough. We are not taking the kingdom of heaven by force. We were too polite with the devil. We are too relaxed about the advancement of heaven into the earth. We are too relaxed about breaking into the spiritual from the natural. Can we have that scripture? 1 Corinthians 16.9. 1 Corinthians 16.9. Understand that God is never your problem. When you come to church... God is not beating you up with his word, but imparting power into you. Washing all the bad thoughts from you. Driving away demons from you. God is always thinking for our good. God is not making a list and checking it twice and see what's wrong with you. You know, we have made... Santa Claus so nice and God so harsh. Have you noticed that? Subconsciously, most of us still think that God is very harsh. There are many, many guilty and condemned Christians. That's who they are. And that's what they think all the time. And so they are locked in the darkness and have no freedom or liberty. For a great door and effectual is opened unto me. There are many, many opportunities. And there are many adversaries. Why do we have to pray? We don't have to pray to beg God. We don't have to pray, God, please heal me. Please heal me. Why don't you heal me? Could you please heal me? It is his will to heal us. But there are many adversaries. It is his will to set you free from addiction of any kind. But there are many adversaries. It is his will to save our backslidden children. It is his will to save our neighbors and our communities. But there are many adversaries. It's never God's problem. But we have an enemy, teams of enemies. And some of them can be people. People working for devils, knowingly and unknowingly. And that's why... It takes time, it takes spiritual prayers for your prayer to advance forcefully for us to take the promises of God by force. Amen. Go with me to James chapter 1, verse 16 to 17. So why our prayers seems like are not answered. Number one, we did not take God seriously enough. Number one. Number two, subconsciously, 
we doubt, we are unsure. And that's why we are not latched on with the will of God. We add maybe, we add not quite sure. If you look at James chapter 1, verse 16 to 17, do not err, my beloved brethren. So he's talking to Christians. He said, don't go off track. Do not err. Don't go off track. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from Kema. David Jones? Your bank account? <laughs> Somebody who would do you a favor? No. Every good and every perfect gift is from above. So we have to get it from above. Where do we have to get it from? Where do we have to get it from? Where do we have to get it from? Above. And not looking at you. I'm looking at Rocket. I'm so angry with you because I want something and you didn't give it to me. How dare you? He's not above. Above. Say with me, above. And comes down from the Father of lights. Father of lights. With whom is no, no, no variableness. Need a shadow of turning. Say to the person next to you, learn not to doubt. One, say to the person next to you, one more time, learn not to doubt. Amen. Say with me, he's my source. God is my source. My only source. Not me. Not myself. Not the people around me, not the world, not the devil. God is my source. You believe that? You believe that? Amen. Reason number three. We turn Christianity into good works, great temperament and morality. Turn it into a religion instead of studying and understanding God's covenant with us. We have a covenant with God. God is not sentimental. He's not emotional. He's not random. He goes by his book. We need to know the covenant. We need to know that saith the Lord. Don't turn Christianity into poverty. Spirituality is not poverty. Don't celebrate poverty. We don't take the vow of poverty. Our God is abundance, 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 abundance. If you study church history, if you study the history of revival, whenever there is a revival, whenever the church starts to rise, whenever there are many people saved, you see all the creativity coming forth, all the prosperity coming forth, the industries coming out, the inventions coming out. But then when you see the world is full of sin, the world is sinful, a lot of sin, a lot of perversity, then what do you see? The wars breaking out. Because sin also works by degree. And that's why the devil would try his best to tempt one person to sin. And then he would tempt the person to sin more. He would tempt that person to sin more. And using that one person to tempt others to sin. Because devil works by degree as well. How much sin can he gather? How much sin can he gather? And so as he gathers more and more, as he gather, gathers more and more sin, more and more sinful activities, more and more sinful thoughts, more and more sinful imaginations, that he can go to a higher level and he can go to a greater scale. And that's when you have pestilence, when you have famines, catastrophes, tornadoes, tsunamis, and wars, international wars, Breaking out. Everything works by degree. We need to understand that. Without your sin, without our sin, the devils cannot do anything. Can't do anything. 
We need to understand that. Amen. So God's will for men is prosperity, not poverty. We all know this scripture, 3 John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Let me ask you, is heaven poor or, health, uh, poor or rich? Is heaven poor or rich? Is hell poor or rich? So who is, who is the wealthy one? God or the devil? God. God is the wealthy one. Amen? Both materials and also spiritual. Virtues as well. And don't trade good works for faith. Don't just doing good works and good works and have no idea what faith is. And don't know how to pray. Don't know how to believe. And don't shift the focus from God's guidance and dependence on God to self-dependence. Don't just say, I can do all things. Without the latter part of that scripture, through Christ, which strengthens me. <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? Take the focus off yourself and focus on God. Focus on Him and draw from Him and receive from Him. It doesn't matter whether you're wrong or you're right, you're good or you're bad. Take the focus off yourself and on God. Can we say amen? That's the best way to live. Can we say amen? And finally, you know, why do we see unanswered prayers? A complicated natural mind cannot believe God. I've made the mistake of thinking too much. I've made the mistake of straining my mind to think too much. I've made the mistake of straining my emotions and feel too deeply. God is simple, but not simplistic. It's good to live a simple life. Say to the person next to you, live a simple life. Forgive and forget. Forgive and forget. Okay? Don't dig back into your childhood. You know why I'm so bad now? Because my mother did not potty train me. You know, why am I so poor now? Because my mother did not give me a good education. Forgive and forget. Simple. Simple. Simple is the best. When you live in simplicity, you can easily love people. A complicated natural mind cannot believe God. Go with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18 verse 3 to 4. Matthew 18 verse 3 to 4. This is Jesus speaking. He said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become what? Professionals? Professionals? And become like what? Little children. You shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven with authority and dominion. Because a complicated mind, a complicated, educated human mind cannot believe God. You complicate everything. You get into the natural logistics instead of the spiritual logistics. Okay? So whoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child. Now when I was in uh, England... I was with my little grandson, who is now one year and four months. And he's like simple, child, a child, just a child. And in the morning, he would, you know, wake up before his parents and he would come into the, into the living room, you know, where the kitchen is. And then uh, there's a little bucket there that we use, you know, to put rubbish. And uh, at that time, the bucket, you know, was empty. And he got into that bucket. He got into that bucket, which was supposed to be used for rubbish. And he made his way into the bucket, stepped into the bucket, both of his legs, both of his legs with his feet at the bottom of the bucket, and he did. <laughs> what do I go 
call that? I call the simplicity of a child. <laughs> you know, a mother would say, what are you doing? Oh, that's for rubbish, not for you. <laughs> Simple, childlike. Simple and childlike. God, how can you heal me? You know, how can you heal me? No, I've Googled. I found out it's a difficult case. It's very difficult to be healed. Oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And the more you Googled, the more worried you become. <laughs> and you know, my daughter said to me, you know, she's a doctor, and she said to me, and especially to her dad, you know, well, Sunny loves to self-diagnose. And Trisha said to us, don't self-diagnose. Go to a doctor. <laughs> we need the experts. And in the case of scriptures, we need the Holy Ghost. Amen? We need the scripture that says all things are possible to them that believe. Can we say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So what is childlike? Childlike means being trusting and uncomplicated. Only two words. How do I get saved? Get saved. How do I get healed? Get healed. How do I get delivered? Get delivered. How do I forgive? Forgive. Isn't that very simple? Isn't that the best? That's the best. Amen. So no more confusion, no more destruction. Live by the uncomplicated mind of Christ. Can we say amen? Don't waver and don't doubt. Okay? Don't waver and don't doubt. Doubts change your position from being a victor to a victim. From being safe and secure to being shaken and destroyed. Our mind must stay on track. You must stay on track. Our mind must stay on track. How many of you have, um, have taken the train? Have seen a track? So how does a train go? Always on the track. So stay on track. That's the word of God. And train your mind to stay on track. And your life would be good, powerful, and successful. Focus, the power of focus, the power of being single-minded. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusted in you. So what is trust? Trust is keeping my mind on the word of God. Trust is keeping my mind on the word of God. Let's give the Lord a big hand of praise. Isn't he good? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So God says, I love you. I have made provisions for you. I've cut covenant with you. But you've got to trust me. And to trust me is to trust the word. Hallelujah. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Father, we praise you and thank you so, so much with deep gratitude for the revelation of your word. Thank you, Lord, for helping us, teaching us, guiding us, empowering us to live a powerful and a successful life on the earth. Not only for ourselves, but also for those around us, our families, our communities, our church, your church, your nations. Amen. So we take up the responsibility. We take up the responsibility. Amen. To go after understanding wisdom. Amen. Commit ourselves to you to live out your word in the name of Jesus. Everyone say amen. Amen. Give the Lord a big hand of praise. Amen. Announcements.